and welcome back to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support YouTube channel. My name is Allison Lawrence and I'm a neonatal dietitian in Southern California. I'm also a certified nutrition support clinician or CNSC and I'm your host for this foundational series. In today's video we're going to be taking a deeper dive into some of our smallest nutrients, micronutrients. Micronutrients are really important when it comes to managing nutrition support from both an enteral nutrition standpoint as well as TPN, so we can ensure that we're providing optimal amounts to achieve optimal nutritional status in our neonatal and pediatric patients. Because micronutrients is such a big topic, today we're going to be focusing on calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D are really important for being able to help to achieve overall bone mineralization. This is especially important for both neonatal and pediatric patients, as these patients are going to be in their prime time of bone mineralization. These micronutrients also play a role in being able to help with various metabolic reactions that occur within the body, including in the heart, the liver, as well as the lungs. It's important to understand the overall physiology of how these nutrients work within the body, so you can understand how to interpret your laboratory values as well as understand the total stores of these values in your patients. Calcium and phosphorus are primarily found within the bone and they work together to ensure that we have optimal bone mineral content as well as content within the blood to regulate what the body needs. This process occurs through a variety of different hormonal regulations involving multiple organ systems. So for example, if we have a low serum calcium level, this will trigger the parathyroid gland to increase the production of PTH or parathyroid hormone. That parathyroid hormone will then act on the bone to trigger bone resorption, which is going to cause osteoblasts to break down the bone and cause a release of calcium. Parathyroid hormone also is going to work to increase the production of calcitriol, which will then increase the intestinal absorption of calcium. Vitamin D also plays a role within this process as well. So vitamin D, when normally ingested, is going to go to the liver, where it's going to be metabolized in order to form 25-OH vitamin D, also known as calcidiol. Calcidiol is then going to be hydroxylated within the kidney in order to form the physiological active form 125-OH vitamin D, also known as calcitriol. Calcitriol then works on the intestines to increase the intestinal absorption of calcium that is obtained through either diet intake or enteral nutrition provision. Now that we've talked about the overall physiology of these nutrients, we'll talk about each of them individually. Calcium is going to be the most abundant mineral within the body, and it's primarily going to be found within the bone. So therefore, the bone is going to serve as a reservoir of overall calcium. Calcium is involved in not only bone mineralization, but also plays a role in cellular enzymatic activity as well as cell membrane function. Calcium is absorbed primarily within the duodenum. When it comes to interpreting laboratory values for calcium, there are two general laboratory values that we can look at. The first is a serum calcium, and although serum calcium is helpful for being able to get a general sense, serum calcium is not the best measure of overall total body calcium stores. This is because serum calcium is bound to albumin, so when albumin is low, serum calcium can also be low. There is a corrected calcium equation that you can utilize in order to be able to get what your calcium might be without the effect of albumin. Ideally, we should be getting an ionized calcium, which would come from your blood gas. Ionized calciums are going to be the measure of the free calcium within the body and give you a better insight into overall calcium stores. Your institution will probably have reference ranges for each of these values for calcium, but in general, you should know what a general normalized ionized calcium is, as well as serum calcium levels, so you can understand if your patient is hypocalcemic or hypercalcemic. When the calcium stores in the body are not regulated, you can have hyper or hypocalcemia. Causes of hypocalcemia include inadequate vitamin D intake, hypoparathyroidism, some medications, as well as low magnesium intake or deficiency. So oftentimes if you have hypocalcemia, you actually won't see a resolution of your hypocalcemia if you also have low levels of magnesium as well. Common medications that can cause hypocalcemia include acetazolamide, which is our carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, loop diuretics, as well as corticosteroids. Hypercalcemia can be due to hyperparathyroidism, which causes an increase in the GI absorption of calcium and a decrease within overall kidney excretion. Malignancy, so where you have bone breakdown and turnover, as well as excessive vitamin D ingestion and a decrease within your serum pH. 
Some medications that can cause hypercalcemia include hydralazine, which is a form of an antihypertensive, thiazide diuretics, as well as excessive vitamin D provision. In states of hypocalcemia, where you might have a patient that requires additional calcium supplementation, there are both IV and enteral formulations available for supplementation. If you have a patient where the GI tract is not capable of being able to be utilized, you can provide IV formulations such as calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate is going to be the preferred format of calcium to give through an IV because this is going to be more soluble and causes less of a precipitation. PO formulations include calcium gluconate, calcium carbonate, calcium citrate, as well as calcium acetate. Enteral and TPN dosing recommendations have been established for calcium for both preterm infants, term infants, children, as well as adolescents. These enteral nutrition recommendations as well as TPN dosing recommendations can be seen on the table here on the screen. Moving on to phosphorus, phosphorus is also really important for being able to help to achieve optimal bone mineralization, but also plays a role in ATP production, DNA and RNA structures, metabolic processes, as well as protein metabolism. Calcium and phosphorus do work together, so they are needed in optimal amounts in order to be able to prevent bone resorption from happening. They also have an inverse relationship with one another, so when you have an increase within one, you will actually see a subsequent decrease within the other. Phosphorus is going to be absorbed in the small bowel, distal to the duodenum. When you're monitoring your laboratory values for phosphorus, you're going to check your serum phosphorus level. Again, established reference ranges are going to be dependent on each institution, but in general, you should know the established reference ranges for your patient population. Causes of hypophosphatemia include hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, vitamin D deficiency, hyperinsulinism, as well as alkalosis. Medications that can cause hypophosphatemia include insulin, antacids, as well as albuterol, whereas causes of hyperphosphatemia include hypoparathyroidism, renal dysfunction, hypocalcemia, acidosis, as well as rhabdomyolysis. Medications that can cause an increase in your phosphorus level include steroids, diuretics, as well as excessive vitamin D provision. When it comes to supplementing your phosphorus, in general, your IV and enteral formulations are both fairly similar. You have the option of sodium phosphate as well as potassium phosphate. You do wanna keep in mind the amount of each electrolyte that is coming from these phosphorus supplementations. So for example, if you had a concern of hyperkalemia in a patient, you would opt for the sodium phosphate provision of phosphorus supplementation. Both enteral as well as TPN dosing recommendations are also listed here in the table for both preterm infants, term infants, children, and adolescents for optimal ranges of these nutrients that should be given through enteral nutrition or through TPN. For neonatal patients, there are some specific considerations when it comes to calcium and phosphorus provision. The first is that preterm infants have higher calcium and phosphorus needs because they miss out on that third trimester. So in the third trimester is where we have the accrual of calcium and phosphorus. Infants that also experience infant uterine growth restriction, IUGR infants, are also going to be at risk of a phenomenon called neonatal refeeding syndrome. This is very similar to refeeding syndrome that occurs in children or adults, where you have a state of malnourishment and you begin to refeed and you see a decrease within the serum phosphorus, potassium, as well as magnesium levels. This phenomenon occurs within neonatal patients as well as we begin to implement their nutrition and we can see a decrease within their serum phosphorus as well as the other electrolyte values. This is important to be considerate of because you want to strategically advance your nutrition, as well as make sure that you might potentially want to start some additional supplementation, such as phosphorus provision. One thing for neonatal patients that we always do is that immediately after birth, we want to provide them with an immediate source of nutrition. This is because we cut off that umbilical cord, and so they have an abrupt cessation of nutrients that's being provided from the placenta. So what we have is we have starter TPN solutions, which contain an immediate source of dextrose, amino acids, as well as calcium gluconate to provide an immediate source of nutrition as well as calcium supplementation. Following that, we are then able to compound a full bag of TPN where we can strategically advance our calcium and phosphorus provision to the goal recommended reference ranges. There are optimal ratios for calcium and phosphorus for neonatal patients that have been established. 
This equates to 1.3 millimoles of calcium for every one millimole of phosphorus, or two MEQs of calcium for every one millimole of phosphorus. Oftentimes, these neonatal patients as well have higher calcium and phosphorus requirements that make it hard to become soluble within your TPN bag. So there are different things that you can do to be able to help to enhance that solubility. This includes having a higher dextrose and amino acid provision, having a lower pH of your solution, focusing on the order that you add your ingredients, so phosphorus should always be added first, whereas calcium should be added last, and also the addition of acidic products such as cysteine. When it comes to enteral nutrition for neonatal patients, one thing that we want to pay attention to is what we're feeding as well as the type of fortification that we're giving. So preterm infants will need to have a fortified human milk feeds because human milk is not sufficient in order to be able to meet their protein, calcium, and phosphorus requirements. You can see here on the table, we have a cross comparison between human milk, human milk fortifiers, human milk fortified with a preterm discharge formula, as well as human milk that is going to be fortified with a standard formula. The main idea that I want to get across here is that your fortification is going to change and not all fortification is created equal. So your human milk fortifier will be able to meet those needs of calcium and phosphorus provision, but you see a dramatic decrease when you switch over to the fortification with either the preterm infant discharge formula or the standard term infant formula. This is important because you really want to have individualized nutrition for each of your infants. So there is no real literature out there that tells you exactly what correct gestational age you want to switch over from your human milk fortifier or switch over from fortification altogether. This process should be really individualized for each infant on the basis of their growth velocity, their laboratory values, as well as their corrected gestational age. Specific considerations for children and adolescents for calcium and phosphorus provision include those patients that have higher needs for both calcium and phosphorus. This includes athletes, children that are inactive, those that have reduced sunlight exposure, as, those, as well as those with insufficient intake. From a nutrition support standpoint, most enteral nutrition formulations are designed in order to be able to meet the calcium and phosphorus requirements for each child when it's given at the appropriate recommendations based off of the age and the weight of the child. If you're ever concerned about your calcium and phosphorus provision for your patient, you want to make sure that you do a full nutrient analysis to ensure that they're meeting those specific needs. Now, when you're monitoring your laboratory values, what can be helpful for interpretation is your alkaline phosphatase, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, serum phosphorus, and even urinary calcium to be able to assess your overall bone status of your patient. Finally, we have vitamin D. So vitamin D also plays a role within bone mineralization and helps to aid in the absorption of calcium and phosphorus. Vitamin D deficiency is characterized by rickets as well as poor bone mineralization. When you're checking your vitamin D level, the laboratory value that you want to check is actually your 25-OH vitamin D because this level is going to reflect your total body stores of vitamin D. When you have low levels of vitamin D, this often is due to rickets, osteomalacia, osteoporosis, maldigestion and absorption, cholestasis, as well as inflammation. There are also medications that can cause low levels of vitamin D, and these include your corticosteroids, which reduce your calcium absorption, cholecetyramine, which is going to cause malabsorption of fats, so therefore fat-soluble vitamin of vitamin D will be malabsorbed, as well as anti-epileptic medications such as phenytoin as well as phenobarbital. When you have excessive provision of vitamin D, this can cause hypervitaminosis D, so you want to make sure that you're not over-supplementing your vitamin D levels. There are established reference ranges for both enteral as well as TPN dosing for vitamin D for preterm infants, term infants, children, as well as adolescents. Neonatal considerations for vitamin D include the fact that human milk is low in vitamin D. So we want to make sure that infants that are receiving exclusive human milk provision or are exclusively breastfed are being supplemented with vitamin D. In general, you do want to make sure that you're calculating the total quantity provided from your feeds as well as from your additional supplementation from your vitamins that you're supplementing with so we can calculate and make sure that our infants are receiving appropriate doses of vitamin D. Children and adolescent considerations include patient populations where they have an increased need for vitamin D, including those that are on specific medications like diuretics, anti-epileptic medications, which can interfere with vitamin D metabolism, as well as those that have steroid use. 
Now, when it comes to looking at TPN and monitoring for both calcium, phosphorus, as well as vitamin D, we want to make sure that we're monitoring our laboratory values on a frequency that is appropriate for our patients. So in general, if you have a patient that's being newly started on TBN, you should get a baseline level of both calcium and phosphorus. You will then be checking these values daily until your TPN prescription is stable, and then you can space out your monitoring to about one to two times per week. For patients that are on chronic TBN use, ideally you should be initiating that level, so getting a baseline level of calcium and phosphorus, followed by repeated measurements until your TBN prescription is stable. And from there out, you can then space it out to about once a month. Vitamin D levels should be obtained as indicated. So if you have a patient where you're concerned about their overall vitamin D status, getting a vitamin D level would be helpful. And then you wanna repeat it on the basis of that measurement. So you might be repeating this more frequently if you have an abnormal level versus you can space it out to once every 12 months if you have a patient who has a stable vitamin D level. That concludes today's video on our micronutrients, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.